Shalom again, dear friends. Havarim, we say in Hebrew, my name is Devora Kalik. I'm with Bless Israel Network, and I want to welcome you back to Heartbeat of the Torah's new series called Our Identity Lost and Found. Today we are in part three. So um, I want to remind you that in part one of this series, we answered three questions. Who are we? Where or with whom do we belong? And who are we following? We also shared how important it is to take off our Western or our Greco-Roman glasses, which has determined our worldview and even the view through which we look at the scriptures and instead put on Jewish glasses. In uh, part two, we also answered a couple more questions and then we began discussing what Rabbi Shaul or Paul had meant when he discussed the roots and branches in Romans 11. We shared that it's important to turn to the Midrash for the answer to what the roots and branches are, what he was referring to, and specifically to a book called the Book of Jasher or Sefer HaYashar, which is validated by the scriptures in Joshua chapter 10 verses 12 through 13 and also in 2 Samuel chapter 1 verses 18 to 27. <clears throat> if you have not watched part 1 and part 2 of this series, please stop this video and watch those before you come back to part 3 because it won't make any sense what I'm going to be talking about in this part. Today, we're going to continue the discussion on roots and branches. And before we look at the book of Jasher, which we'll be looking at probably in part four, we must look at a couple other well-known classic Jewish sources. The first one is Paul Philip Levertoff's Love and the Messianic Age. And this is published by First Fruits of Zion, and there's also a study guide that goes with this. And the second one is the Ram Hal's work, The Way of God, or in Hebrew, Derech Hashem. What I want to do first is we're going to look at what's taught from Paul Philip Levertoff's book, but this is widely taught in Judaism. In, in Jewish mysticism, uh, there is the idea that man's sin during those early days after the creation actually shattered the world. In the Hasidic view, this shattering sent sparks of godliness or netzutzot into the world. In this view, man's task or mission during his lifetime was to find and gather up as many of those sparks that they could and return them to the Creator. Jewish believer Paul Philip Levertoff writes in his book, by collecting the so-called divine sparks that are hidden throughout creation, man has the privilege and joy of becoming Hashem's fellow worker in this world. This gathering of the sparks of godliness is also known in Hebrew as tikkun olam, repairing the world, and it does include the process of turning godless people into followers of the God of Israel and making disciples for the Messiah. After Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, it's recorded that God gave Adam a chance to repair what had happened when he sinned. Now, I know this is not taught in Christianity, but this is widely taught in Judaism. The Ram Chal composed a book which explains these foundational truths and concepts, the one I showed you called 
Derech Hashem, or the way of God. It is a highly systemized work on the basics of Jewish thought, which comes from the Oral Torah. Again, all these things that the Ram Chal has written are hinted at in the scriptures. But we Westerners and non-Hebrew speakers really need help to understand them. Now, I will tell you that these concepts are validated by the Rabbi Shaul or Paul um, in uh, his midrashes in the Brit Hadashah or what is widely called the New Testament. And we will see that one in particular is really alluded to in his writings and we'll be able to make that important connection a little bit later um, in this uh, part. Again, it's important to understand that the topics which the Ram Chal explains in detail are hinted at in the Hebrew of the scriptures, but they're only in very brief, shortened form. This is why we need the Midrash and other Jewish writings in order to fill in the details for us. Now, let's turn to the Ram Chal and what he writes in Derech Hashem. When Adam was first created, he was precisely in a state composed of two equal opposites, the body and the soul. His environment contained both good and evil. As an aside, we know this because there was a serpent in the garden. And he was balanced between the two, between good and evil, to choose whatever, whichever he wished. So this is the idea of free choice. We know that God also determined and decreed that all these generations that would have been born of Adam should exist on various determined levels. Some generations would thus be primary, while others would be secondary, like roots and branches. Keep that in mind. Later generations would stem from the earlier ones and share their characteristics, like branches stemming from a tree. When Adam sinned, he fell from his original high level and brought upon himself a great degree of darkness and insensitivity to God, to spiritual things. Mankind, in general, also fell from its original height and remained on this degraded level where he was not at all worthy of the eternal high degree of excellence that he was originally destined for. Man could thus anticipate only on a very, uh, only a very much lower degraded level and it was in this state that children were born into the world. They were therefore all born into this degraded state. This is what Christianity calls original sin. Now, that concept, we're expanding upon it because the original sin concept in Christianity is very limited. What I want to do is help you understand this from a Jewish perspective. Now, God gave, oh, excuse me. Um, so so I, was, I was saying that um, uh, he was, they was in this degraded state. Nevertheless, even in the time of Adam's downfall, the elevated aspect that had been created in man, existed in man, as a result of his true root was not completely extinguished. Adam was therefore not cast aside completely. He was, of course, expelled from the garden, but he was not cast aside. God was not done with him. And he could return to a higher level. But now he would be functioning under an important disadvantage since he was actually now on this lower plane, which merely had the potential aspect of a higher level. 
God gave Adam's descendants a free choice at that time to strengthen themselves and to strive that they could strive to elevate themselves from this lower state and regain the higher level. We're going to understand this more probably in the next part when we begin to talk about Abraham. The highest wisdom, therefore, determined the length of best time of time best suited for such an effort and accordingly set a limit to that time for these generations. This is from Derech Hashem, section 2, chapter 4. This requires a bit of explanation. So the Ramchal is saying that Adam Harishon, the first Adam, was created at a much higher level intellectually and spiritually than we are today. More about that a little bit later. After Adam sinned, all mankind was born into this degraded state. God in his wisdom attended, uh, uh, determined ahead of time the concept of roots and branches. The root in this case was Adam and his descendants would be the branches. Unfortunately, because Adam and Eve chose to sin, Adam's branches, his descendants were now degraded along with Adam. But there was still hope. God in his wisdom set a predetermined time for Adam to regain what he had lost. He could on his own seek to improve himself because he was still at a much higher level than we are today though he would be at a very severe disadvantage because now he was dominated by his animal soul, what Bible in English calls the flesh. <coughs> Excuse me. So what happened, the further away from the first sin we have come, the more degeneration has happened in the human race. Just look at the condition of mankind today. That is our proof that we continue to descend lower and lower when we let our animal soul or our flesh run amok. Now, it's very important that you hang on to this idea of roots and branches. We're going to come back to it again. We're going to learn more about it with Abraham's life a little bit later. But this is where Rabbi Shaul gets this idea that he shares in Romans 11 about being grafted into the root. And we're going to find out in future episodes who the root is. Well, um, why would Shaul, Rabbi Shaul, be talking about this in a letter he wrote in the first century when the Rav Chal is only talking about it 17 centuries later in a book? Well, it's because the Rav Chal was just repeating what was taught all the way back, all the way back to Shaul, all the way back before Yeshua. This idea has been in Judaism since Mount Sinai. When God revealed these things to Moses, he wrote the Torah. They're there in Genesis and in the prophets and elsewhere. But if we don't speak Hebrew and we don't know what we're looking for, it's difficult to see. Okay, so this concept of roots and branches is widely known in the Jewish faith which is where Messianic Judaism comes from. Okay, so let's move forward here. So we know what happened with Adam and Eve's descendants, as recorded in the scriptures. Cain killed Abel. Abel was a branch. He was one who was seeking to improve himself and know God in his ways. Then came Adam's third son, Seth, who birthed Enosh, from whom Enoch was eventually descended. And then Enoch birthed Methuselah, 
whose descendant was Noah. God determined Noah was a righteous man. He was the first man since Enoch to be called, um, well, Enoch walked with God and then he was taken. But Noah is the first person to be called a righteous man. Why? Because he wasn't practicing the idolatry and the evil that was prevalent all around him in his day. Noah became a root. Though Noah's household was saved, his descendants, who were potential branches, did not achieve a higher level, nor did they even reach Noah's level until 292 years after the flood when someone else was born, Abraham. Now, one very important thing to remember is that mankind was living a very long time back then. Noah was still alive when Abraham was born. Adam was still alive when Enoch was born. Adam's son Seth was righteous, but his descendants became evil. So Adam would have told Enoch everything which happened in the garden and he would have revealed and taught him, he would have revealed the true God to him. He would have taught him about it. Enoch was 62 when Methuselah was born and Adam was only 687. Adam and Enoch would have taught Methuselah. Methuselah was still alive when Noah was born and had an opportunity to teach Noah about God for, get this, 590 years, give or take, since we don't know for sure what age Noah would have been when he began his learning. Here's a real piece of fact that gives us insight into Abraham. Noah lived to the ripe old age of Noah 950 years. And according to the book of Jasher, which is again validated as authoritative by the written scriptures, Abraham lived in Noah's house for 39 years where he was taught about the God of Israel. The, the God who we call the God of Israel. The book of Jasher says that Abraham was placed in a cave by his father Terah and was hidden there from Nimrod who wanted to kill him. Nimrod of the Tower of Babel fame. Nimrod is the first anti-God, anti-Messiah character in the Bible. The reasons for this are another whole story which you can read about in the book of Jasher, chapters 8 and 9. You can find the book of Jasher online. Search for sacred texts and then book of Jasher, and you will find it. The link is www.sacred-texts.com. And then you do a forward slash CHR, forward slash APO, forward slash Jasher, J-A-S-H-E-R. So back to the book of Jasher, Abraham moved into Noah's house when he was 10 years old. So we have a word of mouth testimony direct from Adam to Noah and then from Noah directly to Abraham. I think this helps us to understand about what happened with all those people that are mentioned in the book of Genesis. It's a long story and we unfortunately don't have time to cover it here, but God did not just pick Abraham randomly. This is something that Christianity has not understood. After the flood and the further spiritual descent of Noah's descendants, his eyes were searching for the next root, a righteous man 
through whom he could produce branches who would form a righteous tree, a nation that he could reveal himself to. And in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. At that time, the whole world was following after Nimrod, the first human, as I mentioned, who really became God's enemy. We would call him the first anti-Messiah or anti-Christ. He was stealing souls from the Lord God. This is clear from the Hebrew. He was the king of the Chaldeans. He ruled in Ur and Abraham escaped his clutches. Rather than worship the sun, moon, and stars as everyone else was doing, Abraham perceived one evening when he was looking at the stars that there was a God who was above and beyond all he could see who had created the universe. And he pursued that God with all his heart. There are many hints, as I said, to this in the Torah, hidden in the Hebrew. And unfortunately, in this teaching, we don't have time to cover it all. We know from the written Torah that God chose Abraham and his descendants to become an excellent tree. This is what Rabbi Shaul was alluding to in Romans 11. From there, he divided Abraham and his descendants from the rest of the nations. The nations had their own roots and branches, each with their own unique characteristics, but all those nations remained in the degraded state. Abraham and his descendants became elevated spiritually. However, it was always possible for those other nations to follow Abraham, to follow after Abraham's footsteps and learn about the God of Israel. We'll be talking more about this next time. So that is it for part three. We hope you're enjoying this special Heartbeat of the Torah series, Our Identity Lost and Found. Daniel and I, my husband and I, are committed to strengthening and encouraging the body of Messiah in the nations and here in Israel. And we do that through the work of Bless Israel Network. Will you consider supporting us on a regular basis? No amount is too small, and we appreciate every single penny that comes in from our supporters, and we acknowledge wholeheartedly that we can't do what we're called to do without the help of our partners and uh, people who are not our partners yet, people like you. <clears throat> this is the way that God designed us to work together. Please go to our website, www.blessisraelnetwork.com. You can click on the donate tab and there you are able to give a tax deductible donation. In addition, there are instructions if you'd rather send a check, there are instructions for how to do that as well. God has called us to learn these things that we're sharing with you today. Sadly, because most of us were not raised in Judaism, we haven't been taught these things and Christianity comes woefully short in explaining these wonderful truths to us so that we can better understand our identity. So I hope you'll join me for part four when we're going to be talking about the Jewish soul. What is a Jewish soul? God bless you from Israel. Until next time, Lehitraot. We'll see you later.